Hey guys, this is Dr. Nancy Lee, a director of product. I help engineers and international professionals transition from worker bee to a product manager and business leader. Today, we had the pleasure to invite Big Joe in Silicon Valley to share with you guys how Google built product. What are the roles and the respons responsibilities as a product manager in Google? And Big Joe is a product manager at Google with eight years experience in Google. I bet he has a lot of experience to share with you guys. So Big Joe, can you introduce yourself? Hello guys, my name is Joe. I am a product manager at Google. I've been Google for a few years. I've been working with a few products at Google, including ads, uh, enterprise software, uh, and video-related products. So uh, today I'm going to share with you a few uh, tips as a, as a product manager at Google. But one small disclaimer, I'm going to talk about my own experience. I'm speaking from my uh, own experience about how I build product, how I define product. It doesn't you know, necessarily uh, represent Google. It doesn't necessarily mean that all Google product managers do the same. I'm just speaking from my own experience. Hope that will help. Awesome. Thank you, Big Joe. Yeah, let's do this. Given you have been Google for eight years, let's speak with your own experience. Can you share with us how would you build product inside of Google? What kind of specific framework? The reason I ask this question is that maybe lots of people outside of Google were like, wow, Google is the best tech company in the world. They must use the best like framework and methodology we're all here to learn from you today. Can you start to share with us how would you build a product in Google? All right. So my own experience of building products are with this framework. So there are multiple steps from beginning to the end. So very beginning is I always focus on the users. Who are our users? What do they need? And how do you know, you know what people need are? Uh, most importantly, first, user research. I interview people or send out survey, as well as looking at data on our own product. So you can track your behavior on existing product and find you know, what the patterns of behavior on the product. Starting from there, and then you can build what we call a persona, or what kind of user we're actually targeting for, and what exactly their need, and particularly unmet need. I want to emphasize that, unmet need. So you're already using a product. Uh, there's a gap between what they want and what you actually offer. That is the one you want to tackle. This is the first step to really understand the user. Any questions here? Great, Big Joe. So actually, something very interesting about user research, because at Verizon, we do the same thing, customer first. Mm -hmm. Now, the specific question I have for you is that, how do you do user research? How many is enough? Mm -hmm. For example, anytime you reach and like, launch any new product, you can launch in many different verticals, five mm -hmm. or ten different verticals. Each vertical, there are mm -hmm. lots of users mm -hmm. you can interview. So, mm -hmm. and also, we can also do survey. What's your prioritization in terms of interviewing customers? So, in the user research, there are two major methods. One is qualitative research, one is quantitative research. Qualitative research includes things like user research, uh, sorry, uh, including things like user interview and focus group. And quantitative are things like survey. So, you got things from data and a metric and tells your story. So, quantitative are the ones actually give you the end result. So, it needs to be very large scale. But qualitative are the ones you have very handful, a small number of participants but they give you qualitative result, which can help you define your quantitative research. For example, you can interview, let's say six people, of course, they're very small than people, but based on your conversation with them, they can tell you what kind of options you want to put into your questionnaire. And you send out to, let's say, a thousand people. That scale will, will give you the end result of understanding your community. That's how you combine both qualitative and quantitative researches. Awesome. So, Big Joe, I do have a follow-up question. I like how you put in the qualitative and quantitative. So which one goes first? Do you send out massive survey and then you pick a few people? Or you talk a few first, then you send out massive survey. So which one comes first? Well, so usually qualitative comes first. So usually qualitative comes first. Basically, you, you talk to people and based on your conversation, then you come up with a questionnaire. Makes sense. Awesome. Great. Let's move on to the second part of your framework. Okay. The second part is to actually define the product to meet unmet user need. So based on user understanding, you build a persona and then you know, okay, they want this and then you offer this. So there's a gap in between. There are a lot of things you can do. One very important thing that a PM needs to do is to prioritize uh, all those needs and then uh, 
uh, build a roadmap, what to do first and what to do next. For example, what will be the MVP, the thing that you build very first, and what the next iteration, what the next iteration. This one involves what we call you know, market sizing or the opportunity sizing. You need to size you know, how large is that, is that opportunity. For example, if you do let's say, one feature that is only Nancy can you, uh, use, and Nancy needs it badly, right? Which is awesome. Nancy will like it. However, if you build a feature for Nancy alone, it doesn't help most of the users, right? The opportunity for that feature is only one, which is Nancy herself. So you have to look at all the needs out there. You have different needs and find out the largest need, the largest amount of need, largest opportunity out there. And then you have a sequence of features on the view. Always start with the largest opportunity with the least cost. Uh, basically, you spend the least of resources, but have the highest impact. Oh. Then you start actually writing the requirement. Great. I like that you actually emphasize on like this is a trade-off, right? You you actually focus on the maximum people you can serve and more money you can drive for the, the companies, which is also relevant to the product management interviews that we talk about in our bookend and the free webinars a lot. You need to emphasize on the achievement. If you emphasize on what the uh, the achievement and the benefit impact you bring to the company is also something you need to bring into the product management interviews. Awesome. Thank you, Big Joe. Let's continue to the next session. Yeah, next session is to come up with PRD uh, and then work with the core functional team to actually define and finalize the result of the PRD, such as you work with engineers, you work with designers, you work with other teams, because sometimes your feature depends on other teams' feature. So um, then you talk to all of them and put everything onto your document, every sign off, say, okay, I support this um, this product vision and then support this timeline, we're not gonna build this in, let's say, Q1. Everybody agree with you to it in Q1. That's kind of basically kind of like the, the definition of what we wanna build. Put it into a document. So, Victor, let me ask you a quick question. Lots of mm. students ask me this. Mm. Can you give me an example regarding a good requirement and bad requirement? Mm -hmm. A good requirement is basically have done all the things that I talked in the past. For example, user research, data analysis, as well as prioritization of the opportunity. So that when people read this requirement, they understand the background, the motivation, and, and, and to them, it uh, makes sense to do this because there's lots of opportunity out there to need it. The bad requirement basically, uh, do this because I say so, right? That's kind of the bad requirement uh, because, yeah, you are the PM, you define features, yeah, people will do what you want them to do, but you know, you want to motivate other people to do the right thing. At the end of the day, if a product succeeds, everybody succeeds. So everybody needs to have a faith in the feature that you define. So all the upfront work, as I mentioned earlier, are very important. You need to do them. Uh, second thing is you need to listen to other people, uh, which I particularly emphasize on. Oftentimes, I have an opinion on my own. So I, this is the best feature for the user, biggest opportunity. But I do not always exist on my own opinion. I listen to designers and I listen to engineers. I personally find it very important because Oftentimes, you do not have the big picture or the overall picture. And then it will tell you, well, from a system design perspective, there's actually a certain constraint. Designer will tell you, well, from the overall design perspective, there's certain pattern that's better to follow because there's some like, good practice from a design perspective. So I'm very open to listen to them. And I'm actually very open to, um, to modify my uh, definition, to add you know, different variations uh, to my definition, which I think is going to be helpful. First, from a uh, product define, definition perspective that you get more input. Second, also, you know, the team will, will see you as an open, an open minded person instead of someone who is very dictated, right? Oh, I tell you to do that. You have to follow what I do. I think that's a, that is not a good PM. I think PM should be, you know, be open minded to listen to other people's input. Awesome. I like your example regarding how you engage and listen to engineers. I also heard that. Google specifically is more engineering focused company. You do need to bring everybody together to make decisions together. I do like this. Awesome. Thank you, Big Joe. Mm -hmm. All right. So should we move to the third part? So moving forward, uh, so we're going to do the like, last part, which is the execution part. So now you have user need, you have product requirement, which include an you know, engineering inputs such as designs and mocks, et cetera, right? Yeah. Then you will need to actually execute it, right? So a few things that are important in the execution phase. First of all, it's important to figure out what is the metric that you're going to measure to define a success launch. Uh, after you uh, exact everything, uh, you will need to see whether this product, you know, the launch actually meet your initial thoughts. Uh, for example, you define the success metric as, let's say, number of people use this feature every day, right? Or the success metric is, let's say, the revenue of your product, right? Anything, you know, you can define that 
And of course, you need to agree upon yourself, your engineering team, your uh, uh, designer, leaders, everybody, everybody define a same, you know, metric. And then as you implement it, before you launch, you need to run an experiment, uh, which is also called A-B testing. And the experiment will be run against those metrics you define. That is very important. You have to define that first and then run an experiment and then see whether that experiment meets the, the initial metric that you define. And you say, you say, okay, we run an experiment, half of people will have the old treatment, half of them will have the new treatment, and new treatment does increase the revenue, you know, by X percent, which I defined earlier, and that looks like a successful, you know, execution. And then you can launch it and go back to your first step, say, okay, analyze user behavior in the product, uh, and also, you know, idea, new ideas to, to uh, meet unmet need from the user. So this is kind of a general framework how I define product. Awesome. So, Big John, I do have a follow-up question because during the product management interview, all majority of the students will ask this question: How would you design define the metrics of your product, right? Mm -hmm. And in your example, you mentioned metrics A/B testing. You know, the typical metric in general is daily active users. I also mm -hmm. see that many different ways to define the metric. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some examples regarding how to define the product metrics and what type mm -hmm. of metric do you usually use? Mm -hmm. So, this is a very um very broad question to answer because it really depends on the situation, uh, depends on individual project. Because even uh, even like all the features that I've built uh, in the past, they have been in a very different bucket. So they have different metrics. For example, if a feature is a stage of, of a new feature, it's something really, really new, then it's very difficult to measure the actual impact because you have nothing yet, right? So in that case, uh, things like the like user happiness could be a metric to measure, uh, or you can have some initial uh, estimation of the overall market size based on the, 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 the MVP launch that you, uh, you launched earlier. If the product is in the mature stage, meaning it's already you know, out there and then you are just launching new things to improve it, then you have a lot of old user and old data to compare with. So in that case, you can just you know, define something, for example, either revenue or either users, then you compare with the old to see whether it actually improved or not. So it actually depends on the, the stage of the product. I would say it's going to be a really case-by-case -case thing. And also from an interview perspective, there is no framework, in my opinion, to address this question because every question is very different. You have to think outside the box to address that particular case, that particular product. Awesome. Yeah, you're right. So in summary, I feel the same way about the metric. The metric is so flexible. It has to be case by case as an example. I also like that you mentioned you build MVP, the entire launch of four steps, all the way you launch MVP, right? And then you continue to improve it. That's that's a key of the tech industry. As I described in other interviews, the one part of product management is that in tech industry, it's very fast and people need to build new product using MVP about how to launch a product from concept to execution. You can check out those videos here. Um, thank you so much for Big Joe to share with us. Uh, do you have any summary or final thoughts you want to share with us and how can we get in touch with you? Uh, thanks, Nancy, for your invitation. So really glad that I can share the, the framework I use uh, in, my, in my work. So if you're interested in learning more about career development in tech industry, feel free to come to my channel on YouTube and, and uh, you know, Bilibili for in China. So unlike Nancy, my channel is a Mandarin speaking channel. So I speak Mandarin in my channel, but I'm adding English subtitles gradually. So if you um, look at some old videos in my channel, roughly like a, like a, there's like a one or two weeks delay, uh, you can see I added English subtitle in my older videos. So I talk about all kinds of career development in, uh, in Silicon Valley. And Nancy is actually one of my guests in my channel as well. So uh, yeah, please come to my channel, uh, search for Big Joe in Silicon Valley uh, at YouTube. Thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you very much, Big Joe. Yeah, make sure to check out both channels. I'm gonna link Big Joe's channel in my description so you guys can check it out. And make sure to join the private Facebook group I have for product managers and change maker. I go live in the product manager groups every Sunday to share with interview tips to become a product manager. All right, I'm going to see you next time. See you guys. See you, Joe. All right. See you, Nancy. See you, everybody. Bye-bye.